Uh, thank you for the invitation, Amos, to, uh, to speak here. So issues with in vivo models, cell and tissue culture. Let's not make the same mistake we make in animal experiments. And the main driver for this talk, and we have heard it before, is, is the reproducibility crisis that Mona uh, Baker already published in 2016. And I'm quite happy that uh, reproducibility was discussed already this morning because it's still a great problem. Also, in in vivo studies, in laboratory animal science, we knew already long before 2016 that when working with animals, we have reproducibility problems. And I will very briefly discuss two of those issues. Um, the first one is feed composition and the way we feed animals. So already in, um, yeah, let, oh, I have to go back. Oh, yeah, al already in 1985, Anton Beine showed that um, what you feed the animals has an effect on their physiology and will affect the results of your study. And it's not only what you give the animals, but also how you feed them, because at limitum feeding, what, what is normal with rats and mice, gives obese mice, they live shorter, and they're not as healthy as animals that get intermittent feeding. So we are actually studying non-healthy mice, pathologic mice. So how can we relate the results to, for instance, in preclinical studies, to human situations? So feed is very important in the environment we keep the animals. The other one, and we have heard that before, is substrains. We also have substrains in animals. And the nicest example is the black six mice. Um, people refer always, well, I do my experiments on black six, black six mice, but some of them are not aware that there are several black six strains. So there is a black six strain from Jackson, and there is a black six strain from the NIH. And they originally got the same mice, but because of uh, 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 genetic drifting, they showed a different phenotype over the time. And we still see people, um, I'm an assessor of animal protocols, that use different uh, uh, strains, so either the Jackson or the, the one of NIH, and they still want to compare those, and they're not really comparable. So, in uh, animals, substrains, you get very quickly a substrain. So, uh, as, as this article show, in as little as three generations, so that's really fast, you are already uh, getting uh, a genetic drifting and a new substrain. So, you have to regularly back cross to a bona fide black cisx line to maintain your original characteristics. Okay, now we go to in vitro studies. Because when Mona Baker released her study, I started to realize that actually we have the same problems with in vitro studies. I mean, I'm an old in vitro person, scientist, and always claim that in vitro studies are much better than animal studies, also with regard to reproducibility. But actually, we have a lot of issues ourselves. And we had a very nice example of that. Um, oh, I have to mention, it is also not only important this uh, reproducing results, but also reproducing quality of products or production consistency. So when you use the cell lines, for instance, for the production of vaccines, etc., it's very important that you use always a, a, a nice cell of which you know what it actually is. So um, in 2021, there was an interlaboratory study published, and they uh, studied the variability of A549 cells. So there were two laboratories, one in Switzerland, one in the UK, they followed the same SOPs. They got the cells from the same supplier, ATCC, and they got fetal bovine serum from the same supplier, Sigma. So those are the two issues I'm going to focus on. And these are the results. 
just the basic cell properties, cell viability was different, number of cells per square centimeter was different, and the trans-epithelial electrical resistance of the cells of the two cultures were different, significantly different. And then they, they started to investigate what's the problem behind that, what is causing this difference. And the first culprit they found was FPS. And they found out that they didn't get the same FPS, they got FPS from different lots. And so they say that F FBS can strongly affect the outcome. And in the results they refer to our 2010 paper, where we discussed that batch-to-batch -batch variability related to varia variations in the concentration of serum components, because it's a biological product, so it can't always have the same uh, uh, composition. In addition to the unknown exact composition of FBS, we still don't know what's the exact composition, can also ultimately lead to experimental variability and limit interlaboratory reproducibility. And that led the authors to conclude that if you use FBS in different studies, it will be very hard to get the same results because it will be very hard to get FBS in the, all the different laboratories from the same lot. So it's very likely you get FBS from different lots, and it's very likely that you get different results. So they suggest that we should go to alternative approaches and um, not involving fetal bovine serum. So animal-free serum, preferably. And that there is a batch-to-batch -batch difference was already known at the time that the first paper was published showing that FBS was a nice growth medium for the cells because Buck, who invented it, in the same paper already observed that there was a variability of performance um, when uh, serum was collected in winter or in spring and compared to the other seasons. And we now know that there are a lot of differences not only to the different seasons, but also to the areas where we have uh, ra where we raise the herds. And in addition, and that's uh, important nowadays, when we produce pharmaceuticals, he also noted that there are toxic factors in serum. And that's, for instance, nowadays one of the reasons why EMA here in Europe and uh, EPA don't allow serum in the medium when you are going to produce pharmaceuticals with in vitro methods. Okay. Serum provides proteins, vitamins, hormones, shear force protection, attachment, attachment factors and trace elements, and it's very important for its growth factors. So all, most all cells grow with serum. It has a limited number of antibodies, and therefore it's regarded as a universal medium. So that's why it's so popular at the mo still at the moment. But there are scientific problems. So, the composition of FBS is unknown, so you don't know what you add to your cells and what is influencing the compounds that you might be testing. Well, we have seen that qualitative and quantitative variation between different serum batches may contain different amounts of endotoxins, hemoglobin, and other adverse factors, and may be contaminated with viruses, bacteria, fungi, mycoplasma, and prions, and that lead to reproducibility problems in experiments and safety of the products. In addition, there are animal welfare issues. So there are problems with the transportation of the pregnant cows, which is a problem nowadays in Europe because they have restricted the transportation of pregnant cows, but also the withdrawal of blood from the fetus is a problem. But we cannot always get the guarantee from the slaughterhouse that the uh, fetuses are already dead at the moment they do the heart puncture to collect the blood. So the conclusions when considering supplementing cell and tissue culture with animal serum actually do not unless principle should apply it, be applied. Preferentially the medium should not contain any animal derived component unless it was proved to be an absolute requirement. 
So how do you replace fetal bovine serum? Well, one of the solutions is go to the FCS3 database. We have established the FCS3 database together with uh, Animal Free Research UK. And if you go into the FCS3 database, we have 286 different cell types there at the moment, so still rather small, for which we have 651 different medium. The reason that it is small, that only until recently, uh, people haven't developed serum-free media. It's, it's, since the last five to ten years, people start to be um, developing those uh, serum-free media, and, and it involves a lot of time before you have a serum-free medium. So you go, uh, oh, the, the FCS3 database is uh, composed of commercially available products, that was the original basis, and now also of literature-based uh, uh, records. So modifications of commercially available products and formulations. The problem we have with commercially available products is that you still don't know what's in there. There could be still uh, animal-based products in the commercially in the media, and also they change the formulations without informing the customers. This is what the database looks like. You can here fill in the cell line that you're interested in. Um, then you get, uh, if you have the cell line CHO, you get all the CHO cell lines here, and when you press on one of the records, oh, here's the CHO, all the CHO uh, results. When you press on one of the records, you get more information on that particular uh, serum-free media and a medium and a link to the source, either the journal or the, the commercial uh, supplier of it. Also, if there is not uh, a serum-free medium available for your cells, you may go to the uh, uh, reference and review paper uh, part of the, the website, and there we have a lot of papers that helps you to show different strategies to develop serum-free medium for your own cell. But also, and that's really important, some people tend to forget that, the adaptation procedure. I mean, if you ha have been able to uh, uh, obtain serum-free medium for your cells. Don't put your cells directly in the serum-free medium. They will die. They need to get accustomed, adapted to the new medium. And that's a very careful procedure to do that. And that's described in, um, for instance, very well described in the, the bottom paper. So conclusions, preferentially, the medium should not contain animal, any animal-derived component unless it was proved to be an absolute requirement. And that brings us also to another very popular uh, uh, supplement uh, a medium in which we grow, for instance, organoids, and that's matrigel. Because matrigel is also animal-derived. And because it's animal-derived, we also have batch-to-batch -batch differences. But again, a lot of people claim that they use organoids and, and the other things we... Now, let's first claim what is matrigel. It's a basement membrane matrix uh, produced by Corning Life Sciences. And it's used for 3D culture of organoid culture, stem cell growth and differentiation, angiogenesis assays, tumor assays, and a lot more uh, assays. But this is animal-derived, and it may have different compositions and may contain also xenobiotic contaminants and growth factors. So the origin is the Engelbreth holm swarm sarcoma, and that is maintained and grown in mice. In the base of the tail, they inject the sarcoma, and there it is grown. For every five milliliter of matrigel, one mouse is killed. So you see already when you claim that you are uh, uh, using um, organoids to replace animal experiments and you do it in matrigel, you're not replacing anything. You're still using animals. And there is a lot of suffering involved because the tumor can be bloody or contains a lot of pus and they inject the matrigel 
in the, uh, at the low temperature and injecting a low temperature in a warm animal is causing suffering. So there is also suffering involved. And the tumor size is a problem. So they have to be very alert on the size of the tumor. And also, again, as it says here, there could be pus involved. So uh, an infection of the animal. So both for FBS and matrigel, it holds that also in vitro methods may involve animals and animal suffering. The production of the substance may involve animal suffering again. Many animals are killed for these substances. And there are batch-to-batch -batch differences, and therefore, with the re respect to results, reproducibility issues. And preferably, in vitro methods are xeno-free and animal component-free. And chemically, chemically defined, that, that would be the best situation. Okay, so far, so much for uh, the, the environment in which we grow the cells. Now about the cells themselves, and there will be some repetition of what you have heard this morning. Because another culprit that caused that uh, uh, difference in results between the two laboratories was they obtained a different batch of cells, a different lot of cells. They were not informed by that. They had to go back to the ATCC to find out that they obtained a different lot. And again, different batches of cells potentially introduce experimental variability because the exact differences between the batches is not disclosed by the provider. And one of the causes, and we have heard that before, is genetic drifting. And Cuevedo found that that is prevalent in almost cell lines with a medium of 4.5% to 6.1% of the total genomes, genome size. So ATCC also recommends to uh, passing the cell line for no more than two months of continual culturing because after the two months, the cells may have, may have diverted so much away from the original cell that it is not really representative anymore of the original cell. So that's what, what you also uh, um, concluded. They no longer represent reliable models of the original source material. So you should not overpass it yourselves. And then the one that has already a lot of attention this morning is the cell that you're working with, really, your cell. And then we refer to the cell of Saurus database where we have the problematic cell lines uh, uh, and we have seen this already, it, it's already in the menu. And when you go to the dip, you, you get a whole list of the problematic cell lines where you can check of your cell, whether your cell is problematic. And that is really flagged, clearly flagged in the Cellosaurus database. And the cell contamination, and, and Amanda has already showed that, is not new, it is already known for a very long time. So in 1962, Brent already showed that several human, monkey, rabbit, swine, calf, and whatever tissues are actually either mouse or human species. And we heard a name Gartler this morning also already, and he showed in 1960 that four cell lines, three stated of human origin and one of rabbit origin, were actually mouse origin, and probably consisting of L cells. So the contamination, we have that already for a long time, and also Gartler showed the different cell lines were not the cell lines that were supposed to be. They were actually the cervical cancer cell line, HeLa. And, and that's, well, we know that's a very problematic cell line that affects a lot of other cell lines. So go to the Cellosaurus database. So what are the costs of unauthenticated cell lines? Between 18 and 36 of cell lines may be contaminated or misidentified at the moment, it, uh, at the moment of 2018, when Hughes published his results. So that's quite a lot, between 80% and 36%. So that really shows uh, well, what others has, have already, already um, uh, argued this morning, that you have to have your cells regularly checked, either by DSMZ, ATCC, and whatever organization that provide these services. Then one thing I would like to draw attention that has been mentioned this morning also, that there are gender differences between cells. 
Uh, you may recall that in 2014, NIH introduced a new policy where they required that there is a balance between the sexes when you do cell culture and animal uh, studies. Because uh, uh, men and women are different, uh, and, and that's well known. So here you see an example of uh, 2015, where uh, STR uh, studies were done of 855 annotated female cells, actually 331 were males. The other way around is a little bit less. Of 600 annotated males, only 10 were females. So also here in cell, we misidentify the sex of the cells. And sex of the cells is different, two examples. There are gender-specific differences in expression in human lymphoblastoid cell lines, and we do have the gender of cells really matter when screening for novel anti-cancer drugs. So when you do some pre-screening, you really need to be aware what the sex is of your cell, otherwise you may come up with not very reliable or translatable results. So in conclusion, over subculturing cells uh, leads to genetic drifting. There's a problem with misidentification of cells and sex of gender of cells matter. And there are a lot more issues with in vitro methods, which I can't discuss now. Thomas Hartung already discussed all these issues in 2007. So there are a lot more issues related to in vitro methods that we should be aware of. And luckily enough, like with animal studies, nowadays we have guidelines that helps us identifying those issues and improving our studies. So these, those are the different good cell culture practices guidance and toward good in vitro reporting standards. So ECFAM produced good cell culture practice, two different reports for just ordinary cell culture, but later on they also produce uh, good cell culture practices for stem cells and stem cell derived models, and good cell culture practice for human primary stem cell derived and organoid models as microphysiological systems. And actually for me the best and the most extensive guidance report was published in 2018 by the OECD where they not only focus on the actual experiment, but also all the, condition around, all the conditions around the in vitro studies, like the roles and responsibility of in vitro method developers, quality consideration, the facilities, strategies to avoid cross-contamination, um, uh, requirements for all the materials and reagents, and so on and so on. Oh, staff training and development also very important. So it's really interesting to read this extensive paper and see whether you can learn something from that. Because we, most of the time we are so stuck with our routine practices that we forget that there are also other issues that we have to take care of. And then the last uh, warning, in vitro reporting standards. So now Barazova found out that the two different laboratories had different strains for their studies. They now reported not only what cell they used, they also report that they have different lots and they reported the different numbers. So that in case you want to repeat their studies and you got different results, you can tell that you might have a problem with the lot you obtained from the ATCC. So, um, we are pushing that with animal experiments, but we have to push that again, and it was said this morning already, um, and uh, Anita has stressed that also. The materials and methods have to be meticulously written down, because otherwise we have a reproducibility problem. Okay, so an overview. We have a problem with medium, in particular FCS and matrigel, cell identification, genetic drift, the gender and sex of the cells. So in it, also in vitro methods face comparable issues as animal experiments, so we can learn from them as well. And performance of good and well-informed research could avoid these problems. And very important there is experimental design and reporting 
on the experimental design and knowing the ins and outs of your model. A regularly updated good cell pack culture practice could facilitate best in vitro practices and detailed reporting contributes to reproducibility. And I hope then that in a couple of years we can answer this question with a no. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, and uh, I think it's very, very important for all people working in labs that all this consideration. Uh, I, I was thinking about something because in the lab I, not, I could notice that also a very important aspect is the time when you are doing your experiment, especially when you are working on metabolism, for instance. Uh, the cells are submitted to a circadian clock. Absolutely. And uh, do you think that this is also something that we should consider? Yeah. Yeah. And we should maybe uh, also um, give this kind of information in the papers? Yeah. Yeah. We have seen, well, I didn't have time to discuss that, but in, in, in a much longer presentation, <laughs> I, I had that as an example, and I, I showed you their papers where they sh uh, uh, showed different results uh, dependent on the time of the day, because indeed cells do have a circadian rhythm. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting and informative. Um, do you think it would be a good, uh, a good uh, step towards having uh, uh, FCS alternatives if uh, providers like uh, ICAC, ATCC, when you buy a cell line, instead of giving uh, the cell and the media the standard one with the FPS, they give you instead the alternative immediately how to grow the cells? Because a pushback that we have uh, all the time is, oh, I've, I've gathered all my data with this condition and they won't be any more reproducible, yeah. which I understand. But if you start from scratch and you go to ATCC... And Absolutely. Say, oh. When you start a new cell line, I, I think it's an absolute uh, must to start it with serum-free medium. Yeah, yeah, but it would be good to have in, uh, when you buy them that the first option is actually the serum-free. Yeah, yeah. And then not, not the serum plus. And you know, the problem is that, that some people say, well, when I move away from fetal calf serum, my cells get different properties. And then my question is, well, maybe those are the properties of the original in vivo cell. Because I think fetal calf serum introduces a lot of artifacts that are not related to the original in vivo cell. Absolutely. And also the other thing that I personally believe uh, uh, that should be an overall completely of the culturing condition in general. Because, for example, the amount of glucose in the media is a lot. I mean, we have uh, diabetic cells most of the time. It's true because 3.5 grams liters is a lot, and maybe considering a hypoxic condition instead yeah, of also. a normoxia yeah. and maybe CO2 content. So I think it would be nice to have a, this this uh, starting this this topic starting on all uh, to create a real uh, better reproducible system as a baseline for animal studies. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. One question, I mean, in your list of problems you didn't have time to talk, so it was zombies. Can you, in one or two sentences? <laughs> well, that, that has to do with the traditional way of 2D culture in which we uh, um, change the medium one or two times a week. So the cells are not stimulated. They're just sitting there. They're, they're, they're uh, zombies. And, and the biggest problem then arises when you change the medium. They suddenly get a push again, uh, and, and then again they turn into zombies because they have to wait for another couple of days before the medium is refreshed and before they get all the nutrients. They and, and they're flowing around in their own waste material, which also makes them zombies. Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry, so was a I'm sorry, yeah. yeah okay. sorry. I, I have a question. So I wonder how people make the serum free medium. How they make it? Yeah, so I mean, recently some research group create tissue culture medium based on the data of RNA sequencing data. So meaning that we can optimize tissue culture medium 
based yeah. on the proteome or transcriptome data. So do you think we need to improve the uh, serum-free culture menu? Sure. So, yeah. And uh, do you know somebody who can do? Well, go to, to the page I showed you. There are several pa papers that show different uh, ways to get to serum-free medium for your particular cell type. It's, it's a tedious process, I have to say. Um, the other thing you can do, uh, Stina Oritsen, I think it's last year or the year before, but I can give you the reference, produced a serum-free medium, and according to her results, several different cell types already grew in that medium. Because for the ones who are not familiar with uh, serum-free medium, up until now, uh, the new medium you develop was really particular for each cell type. Each cell type needs its own serum-free medium. So it was a challenge now to find a universal serum-free medium. And it seems that Stina Oritsen has found uh, a serum-free medium. So that's worth trying. And she gives the full formulation in her paper. So you can easily use that as a basis for uh, your cells. Thank you.